Please remember, the information in our podcast could be a trigger for some people. And if you or someone you know has been affected by sexual abuse, the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre 24-hour helpline is 1-800-77-8888. Hello, I'm Joyce. I'm June. And I'm Paula. We're the Kavanagh Sisters, and we'd like to welcome you to our series of Count Me In podcasts, where we continue to shine a light on childhood sexual abuse and its impacts. In today's podcast, we'll be talking to Eve Farrelly, Executive Director of CARI, Children at Risk in Ireland. Eve holds a Master's in Management, Business, Marketing and Related Support Services. She also has a Master's in Criminology, a BA in Psychology and an Advanced Diploma in Data Protection Law. Carrie is a registered charity and has two full-time centres, one in Dublin and Limerick. It's a leading voluntary organisation with a proven track record in providing child-centred specialised therapy and support to children, families and groups affected by child sexual abuse regardless of means. Carrie's, Carrie's based in Dublin, 110 Drumcondra Road Lower, Dublin 9, and in Limerick on Ennis Road, Shambouli. Carrie's confidential helpline is 1890 924 567. How did you come to work for Carrie? What brought you to? Um, oh God, so I, I've been working in Carrie about 10 years now. And I came to work in Kerry because back at the time I went back to college as an adult to do my undergrad in psychology. So when I left school, I went straight into the workforce because that's what you did in my house. You had to do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so when I had an opportunity to go back to college, I always wanted to do a degree in psychology. And there was no placements or anything like that in the degree. And I remember one time <coughs> the lecturer turning around and saying, you know, you want to think about you're going to be graduating with 300 people who have the exact same degree as you and how are you going to stand out? What's going to make you different from these 300 other people? So you might want to think about doing a volunteer position or stuff like that. So, you know, I really heard that. And so I did different kind of volunteer positions. Like I volunteered with OCD Ireland. So they like ran support groups for people with OCD and body dysmorphic disorder and trichotillomania and stuff like that. They ran them in St. Pat's Mental um, Hospital. And then I did some work with AVP in the Irish prisons, so working with violent offenders about making better choices um, and non-violent ones. And that was real learning for me. Mm -hmm. And I think my love of volunteering came from that. You know, you do give your time, but you get so much more back when, when you give. And at the time, I wanted to be a clinical psychologist. That's what I wanted to be. I don't want to be that anymore. Um, <laughs> And I thought the best way to find out how to get to some place is to go to somebody who's already there and find out how they got there. So I took a listing of all the clinical psychologists in Dublin and I sent out my CV and a letter and I said, oh, this is me and this is what I want to do and how did you get there and is there any experience you could give me? And just sent them out and so we'll come back. And there was lots of things that came back. They were very generous. And one of the clinical psychologists was the then clinical director of Perry. And he said, sure, why don't you come on in and sit down and have a chat and see what you can do. And so I said, all right, I can do that. So I came in and I sat down and I had a chat and I started volunteering on the helpline at that stage. And I've been here ever since, you know. I mean, I really felt that when I walked into Carrie, I found my professional home. You know, mm. this work isn't for everybody, um, but it's definitely for me. And I think that the ethos that Carrie have with respect to children is very much aligned with mine. And so my buy-in is there from the get-go. And I've never left, really. And that's how I started. And do you have children of your own? I have three children. Yeah. So I have, um, well, in July, they'll be 17, 15 and 5. Wow. Well, that's a good gap. That's a a great gap, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you're very happy here. I'm very happy here. I'm really happy. Like, I mean, this kind of work can be tough. But, you know, the work with the kids was never as tough as maybe the challenges of making sure you get to all the kids. You know, that can be difficult when you're working in an NGO where you're constantly trying to find the resource 
because you know, you, like we're all really clear on the work that needs to be done. And it can be frustrating when you have that clarity, but you don't have the means. Mm. So that's more stressful, really, than the work with the kids, because the kids are great, you know. How much of your time would be spent between doing the work that needs to be done here and then doing fundraising? Our funding is twofold. So we get funded for our therapy and our helpline through Tussle. And we get funded for our court and our forensic service through the Department of Justice. But all of that funding is part funding. And so we make up the gaps exactly. um, through our fundraising departments. Right. And we have a fundraising team in Dublin and we have a fundraising team in Limerick. And their job is to basically plug the gap that the grant funding leaves. That's a struggle. They are quite creative though. They are very creative. They are very creative. They're very passionate. And I think that's where their creativity comes from. And Carrie is very much a wheel that has all spokes in it. And you miss one spoke and the wheel becomes weaker. There's no one person that that drives Carrie round and round. It is everybody together. And they're a huge spoke in that. Like for us to run the service with the gaps, we have to raise an additional 360 grand a year. Now, for us to be able to, now that's to run the service with 85 children on our waiting list with right. no way of getting them in to the therapy room. So in order for us to get them off our waiting list, we have to get and seek an additional 600. What does Kerry do? Okay, so Kerry has a number of services. Okay, so the core service that we have is a therapeutic one. So we provide therapy for children up to the age of 18 who've been impacted by sexual abuse. And we also provide therapeutic intervention for children up to the age of 12 who present with sexually harmful behaviours. Now our therapy function works off this rule of thumb. It takes the village to raise the child. The therapy um, lasts for one hour a week, but the child resides within their family for the rest of that week. And we have to make sure that the family is supported and that the family are upskilled in everything that they need to do to support the child in that week. So let me be so, clear. You mentioned two types of therapy there, one up to the age of 18 and one to the age of 12. Yes. And the 12 is around sexual abuse. Up to the age of 12 for children who present with sexually harmful behaviours. So okay. that's where they're coming into us. So where you're trying to nip it in the wood before... It yeah, because, the real because issue. really what, what sexually harmful behaviour is for children within that age group is a presentation of a child who has experienced something that is beyond their cognitive ability to understand. And in their attempt to try and understand, yeah, they're definitely. presenting in this way. So we're working with a child who absolutely needs support to figure out what that is. And that can be an array of things from too much isolation it could be um, some social issues, it could be some strain within the family home, it could be sexual abuse or sexual exploitation and exposure to something that is beyond their accountability. It could be an array of things. Are they self-referrals or do they, do they come through the HSC? Or? They come through Tusla. Yeah, right. okay. Most of our referrals come because we're post-assessment. So that means that children who come into therapy have to be in a safe space right. because it's counterproductive to engage in therapy when they're not, so they, it, it has to be post-assessment. Is Kerry the only place? Well, there's, there's other organisations that would provide... Um, for children. Therapy for children, but like say, for example, St. Louis's and St. Clair's would provide therapeutic intervention for children, but their remit is children where they've gone through their assessment and the assessment is conclusive, so we would take maybe children where the, the result has been different from that. And I mean, there's private therapists out there as well that provide this work. I'm not sure if there is anybody else like Carrie that does it. It's this. just, it speaks volumes, you know, when we profess to hold our children as so valuable and you look at the resources there. It's bad enough for the adults, mm -hmm. but the children is where, you know, we're talking about mopping up after the fact it, with the adult yeah. services, yeah. but the children is where the nub of it is, and yet there's only really Carrie. Yeah. Like it's Carrie's belief and it's my belief that the experiences that children have in their childhood doesn't have to become the fingerprint of who they are in adulthood. It doesn't have to be. And I think that if we can support children when they need support and give them the right support, we can empower them to, to fulfil who they are the way they want to whilst having those experiences that happened alongside them. Do you have any statistics on... On how many children have passed through here or any of them that have offended later in life? 
we tend not to come back to the clients that leave years later. We don't tend to do a longitudinal look of things like that. Uh, we have had clients come back and thank us and come back in adulthood and that kind of stuff. But they're kind of anecdotal, I suppose, just yes. statistical, because they're individual people come back given yeah. their experience. And again, it's lack of foresight and resources to be able to do oh, this kind of research. Absolutely, I mean. absolutely. Because when you've got 85 children on a waiting list, you're firefighting exactly. 100%. And how yeah. many children do you treat at, at, at a given time? Like 56 children in recurring therapy last year. So that's every week. And when a child comes into therapy, what happens because the family needs support as well. So every child that comes in, they get allocated two therapists. One therapist goes to the child and then the other therapist goes to the family. And parental sessions are run parallel with the therapy sessions so that the whole family is receiving that support all the way throughout. And it's child led. So we can't say with this type of experience that you can come in and you can get eight sessions and then you're done. It just doesn't work like that. We have to be led by the child. So that will run for as long or as short as the child needs and they will come with their own individual needs. And is there uh, an average? Or? I mean, it's an average of, I'd say, about two years. Okay, so it's similar to, to, it's similar to an adult, really. Yes, yeah. Now, and I mean, in our situation, we can't vouch for the fact that intervention as children would have saved us a lot of pain, but I can yeah. imagine it would have. Yeah. It's because uh, you know. well, the one thing we do know uh, and the one thing we are trying to sell to everybody is one, it's important to tell your story but two, if you don't interrupt your thought patterns as quickly and as soon as humanly possible you create so much more damage down the road yeah. because it's, it's like it's easier to teach you something new than to unlearn something that you've already got yeah. embedded in your yeah. nature and things that we've accepted as part of who we are as opposed to things that were gifted to us. We are felt as well as children because we were abused as children that we didn't have, you know, the way if you were raped, God forbid, you know, your struggle is to go back to who you were. Yes. We didn't know who we were because yeah. we were never anything other than victims and sex slaves. And yeah. So, you know, that was one of the hardest things we discovered that we had to actually, we couldn't rediscover ourselves. We had to make ourselves. From day one, yeah, you know, that was more difficult, and it is, like, as Paula said, the unlearning is a lot more difficult than learning. I definitely think that children have the most ingenious and creative ways of surviving their world, yeah. and they create wonderful mechanisms to survive that. And I think the issue is is that those mechanisms in adulthood almost become defects yeah. because they're no longer needed yes yeah. they were absolute gifts in childhood because they got us from a.m to p.m yeah. every single day and so the work is having to look at the child that resides within doesn't realize that she's not in that world anymore that actually she's now in the body of an adult and this adult isn't subject to the same stresses and the thing about sexual abuse for me People think of it as an event, but for a child it's not an event. Yeah. Because even when it's not happening, you're worrying about it happening. You know what I mean? It's always there in the brain. Yeah. There's always that level of alert and checking in your world. So there's no rest. There's no peak and drop, peak and drop in an event. It's in your brain all the time. Your system is up there worrying about it all the time. And that impacts on your ability to do anything yeah. in your world. School, <laughs> you know, friends, making friends, keeping friends. And they're, these are all huge things in a child's life. You know, they make up the entirety of a child's life. And all of that has to be addressed. And a child has the right to have that addressed. And they don't have the autonomy to do it themselves. Yeah. We have to do that. Well, now, I, I'm gladdened and reassured that somebody that's at the top of an organisation taking care of children has your level of awareness and understanding of of the issues and the fact that you're getting children post assessment you're not involved other than accompanying them in courts you we have we have one service where we would capture them a little before that we have what's called advice appointments so what happens with an advice appointment is somebody will ring up the helpline and possibly will just have had a disclosure they're in that crisis mode within the family and Having identified that that's where they are in it, we will bring them in for an advice appointment and they don't have a waiting list for that. It's a crisis service where they come straight in and meet with one of our therapists for about an hour, an hour and a half. And we help that family get themselves onto the road 
to linking in with TUSLA, getting the assessment done, getting the safety implements in for the child immediately. So we're, we're helping move the family from danger into safety with respect to that. And here's the thing, families don't know about this. They don't know about it until they're thrown into it. And then when they're thrown into it, they're reacting in a crisis way. But we do have that service for the AA. And what I'd love to um, develop a little bit more is the prevention side of it, reaching families before it happens. Yeah, because as soon as the crisis or the disclosure happens, a natural instinct for a lot of people is the anger, the rage yes. and the looking for somebody to blame. Yeah. But when it's one of your own, yeah. that is actually the cause of it. That just gets so complicated for everybody involved. Yeah. Then what everybody does is turn it all inwards. Yeah. Because you can't hit out at somebody that you feel you loved. And say it's a son yeah. who rapes a daughter. The complexities of that is just dreadful. It's so complex. And you and we can really see that complexity in the courtroom. There's a massive difference between um, supporting a child where the defendant is extra familiar and when you're supporting a child where the defendant resides in the same family tree. Yeah. There is a massive difference there. Absolutely. And, you know, when we're dealing with the latter, um, there's no real happy end to no. it. Somebody in the family will walk out devastated, irrespective of what the result is. And the ramifications of it will stay fractured. Because when you're dealing with somebody outside the family unit, that's really clear. We all rally around. We're all one family. We all yeah, link and together them. and there's an us and them. And the us and them is really clear. But it's not clear when it's a family member. And for children, actually, it's particularly distressing when you see a grandmother who sits on the other side of the bench. For some reason, that really hurts children, from my experience. Of Adds to the sense of blame yeah. that the child has yeah. adopted. And there's huge blame on that. Like Children wear a huge burden as a witness, but also as a victim and as a child themselves. And children are expert at having gaps in the narrative and absorbing them as their own fault. Yeah. The default is, it's my fault. And a lot of the work that we would do in court is to try and readjust some of the cognitions around that. So for children, they think absolutely whatever they do will be the cause of the result yeah. of the court case. And that's not the case. So we kind of use this jigsaw analogy where the judge has a piece, you have a piece, I have a piece, the jury have a piece. And only all of these pieces together make the big picture. And your job is to go in and tell your story, and that's only one piece of it. And another huge distortion with court, um, for us with children is, and with families actually, is they feel that this would be the place, and it's extra important in interfamilial cases, where I would be believed. This would be the decider of whether um, I'm believed or I'm not. But actually, it's not. Because if you think about the process that they've gone through, they've been believed at so many different levels. They've been believed with the guards. They've been believed with the social workers. They've been believed with the DPP. They have been believed at so many levels that they are invisible to them and they don't exactly, see. Yeah. The court is two people arguing the law. That's what it comes down to. It's, it's so confusing because when I think of our court case and we were grown adults when ours took place, we still didn't feel believed until the verdict was handed down. Yeah. So all those processes beforehand didn't mean anything to us. That's kind of why abuse works so well on children is because you naturally, the world resolve, revolves around you. Yes. So why wouldn't you take the responsibility for everything that's, that's around 100%. you? That's yeah. 100%. Yeah, Eve was talking there about children taking blame and responsibility for everything and how the abuse actually affects so many things internally. We've always had to struggle because as children, we felt like adults trapped in the child's body. We had too much information that we couldn't yeah. comprehend. But as adults, it was reversed because we actually felt like kids, but we looked like adults and we were expected to behave That's like really adults. On our first book, we wrote as children, we wrote the stories and the memories as kids. We went into it and wrote it from that point of view. We wrote it in the first person. We thought it was really important that for our own journey and also for anybody who was reading it, the, the reality of abuse and what's going on in the child's mind at the time it's happening yeah. is out there. Yeah. So there was a couple of reasons why we did that. But our book we wrote after that. It's more like a self-help book. Yeah, but it, it more explains all of those psychological issues because that we you only have. discovered them ourselves. And did you have an awareness of the one that resides within? No, no. Or did until... you just make decisions? No, not until no. way down the line. Yeah, yeah. It was after we'd been through therapy and everything, yeah. and we were supposedly finished therapy, 
And that's when the real work began because yeah. until we began writing our books, all of the information that we had kind of gathered till then that meant nothing to us started to fall into place. Yeah. And we were able to marry it with our own experience and integrate the learning and gain benefit from all of it. But without that final piece of the jigsaw, we wouldn't have It's like yeah, it's like you were explaining about how when you're when you're in this and there's no up and down, it's constant. Our focus and our energy went completely on survival. Yeah. So we couldn't learn in school, which only told us how stupid we were. Another thing to beat yourself up over. So yeah. that was a constant, but no, we couldn't have been aware because it wasn't safe to be aware of anything yeah. other than getting from here to there. Absolutely. Like, I don't care that Jules getting raped in that corner, if I was over that one getting battered. I want to get from here to there. I can't yeah. take on their shit as well as mine. Yeah. We could swear blind that we didn't know about each other. And yeah, well, he clicked his fingers and the first thing we all froze and said, I hope he does not me. Yeah. So when we discussed that, we said, Jesus, that implies he might want somebody else and we knew he might yeah. want somebody else. Yeah. So it's all of that. It's the known and not known because yeah. we didn't like we know. Had gone, when you think, well, we had gone through the whole therapy process came out the other end, and we're talking after quite a few years, four or five years, wrote the first book. Even when we wrote the first book, we didn't know what disassociation was, what compartmentalization yeah. was. Yeah. We didn't know there was names to them. We knew we had yeah. all of those, and we described them, but we didn't know what they actually were. Was there a relief when he got yeah. those names? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, it was it's like, almost like being normal. It yeah. was like penny yeah. dropped, and that ability to say, actually, it really wasn't my fault. Yeah. And all of these things happened because of it. But all of these things you can turn back. And you need that understanding yeah. because that understanding lets you off the hook for all the things you took responsibility yeah. for. And long after the abuse you believe is resolved, you still take responsibility for having a shit life, for everything that's wrong in your life. Yeah. You still think that's down to you. So when you understand that, especially with childhood sexual abuse, every aspect of your life has been altered. Every decision, every choice, yeah. every friendship, mm -hmm. every relationship is all governed and you know, driven by what, what was born out of the abuse. When you understand all of that, it's like, huh, it's like, you know, I see yeah. the light. Yeah. And you can forgive yourself and then naturally follows your curiosity about why would this happen? You know, what could have happened to somebody to do such a thing? You can't comprehend it and you never will and you shouldn't try, but it opens up your mind to forgiveness to the realisation that holding on to hatred is hurting you, not them. Mm -hmm. And you only forgive for yourself. They don't even need to know about it. And it's just, it changed everything for us. And if we had even understood, and, and really a tiny detail, when we first went into therapy, and you first encountered your therapist and you're sitting there, if we'd have understood, as adults we weren't sitting there, as children we were, yes. we didn't even understand that. Yeah. Can I ask... If you could give us advice as professionals who work with children, what would you like us to know? That you have to explain everything. Okay. In a language that's Even what you're explaining now is, you know, I wouldn't have been able to take that in as a child. So. Yeah. But like even you being saying those, those, when you go to court, all those pieces of jigsaws, if somebody had even told us that as grown women, yeah. they would have went, ah. Oh. The fact that the most important thing to say is, I believe you. I'm yeah. so sorry that happened to you. You absolutely did nothing to deserve that. You're completely innocent. I'm saying you need to repeat that yeah. often. We also didn't grow up in an era where it was widely understood that this goes on. We thought it was just us, just our family. We also didn't understand that it was wrong. We didn't even know what it was. We thought we were virgins and we were being raped on an almost daily basis. Like We didn't know, we didn't have the emotional intelligence or maturity to name our feelings, to describe how we felt. It was just because we had been groomed at such a young age, this was our identity. Yeah. You know, you know, you were saying it, it, this happens to a child, it doesn't have to be, yes. it doesn't have to define them. Well, it definitely defined us, we, it was our life. I think one of the most important things to give a child is the, the information they need to be able to understand what an emotion is and explain it. Because I can tell you, even as an adult, I would struggle if I get really excited over something, I cannot tell you the difference between excitement and anger yeah. internally. Because if I have heightened awareness of anything, then they all feel the same to me. 
Yeah. And I don't know how you'd explain it to a child, but a child's way of coping in a trap situation is dissociation. Yeah. So you just, you go off usually into your own head. People describe looking at the corner of a room, looking at a spot on the wall. It's taking your focus out there somewhere so you're not here when all this is happening. Mm -hmm. And you usually cut off, and that's why a lot of people, like Jay's in particular, with sex as an adult, found it very difficult to actually be in our body long enough to have an orgasm, to I feel sensation. And even grass. now, yeah. even now she is. Batteries run out and everything. Even now, she is <laughs> being the jurors that would work. <laughs> even now, you could be hungry, you could be yeah. tired. And, and she's know. completely unaware of it until she lies down at night and she's going, jeez, I'm wrecked. So, so it's so like an ongoing, it's, it's an ongoing so, yeah, thing. It just happens naturally. Yeah, so I've check, just yeah. stopped associating now and I'm not associating yeah. anymore. You have to but, constantly yeah. work on it. We believe with our second book, if we'd have known that information sooner, yeah. at the very least, it would have saved us years of yeah. self-hatred. Somebody had told us what attachment disorder was. Yeah. In, I would have taken in the bits that matter to me when they matter to yeah. me. And then I take in the other bits when they matter. That could have so changed my life if I'd understood that the reason why I had difficulties bonding and making relationships with people had nothing to do with my abuse. That's was it. Down yes. to that and I think don't underestimate children. Um, give them these um, this information in child format, like yeah. um, explain their responses and the normalcy of them. You know how you survived, like pointing at that corner. Or, you know, the dissociation or leaving your body or whatever. I think I would have loved to hear that as a young child. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying I would take it in, but I definitely would have taken in something. Yeah. I would have done anything to please him, thinking in return he would love me. And I think, you know what, I think that is the bit that is really different from an extra familiar yeah, family, family. Yeah. because when the hand that loves is also the hand that hurts the confusion that stems yeah. from that and you hate the hand that hurts there the are hurts. incidents where it's not in the family but people just still depend on what their own family life is yeah. they could return to the crime for that affection because if they've been groomed properly the per the perpetrator convinces them that they're their best friend, they understand them. Yeah. Every single yes. case is individual. Mm. The little thing like saying to somebody, tell me how you feel. Not being able to answer that made you feel, oh, I'm a fucking idiot, you know, yeah. I can't even, can't even say how I feel. Yeah. But see, isn't that the thing we talked about, even with Brené Brown, that you have to teach children emotional intelligence, that yeah. it's not given any credence in school even, but I think it's a definite. And in your field, it would be great because you could actually help the child mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. how they feel. Yeah. I was just always wanted to ask that, really. You know, I think yeah. it's important to get... Yeah. Oh, you're definitely um, getting air books. <laughs> <laughs> now, come here, on, on a not-so-nice note, is there a cost involved in bringing a child here? Yeah. It costs about... Because, remember, every, every child in our therapy um, service gets two therapists. So on average, that will cost a year at about seven grand. Right. Yeah. And does the family themselves pay that? or do they... No, no, no. Children come and they get therapy, you know, irrespective of their means. Right. If they can leave a donation, that's fantastic, but that doesn't dictate whether they get therapy right. or not. Okay. And that, that counts for the family getting therapy the whole lot? The child and the family for one year. Right. Yeah. Can somewhere on the website I was looking, and you were looking for outreach centres to develop outreach centres, is yeah. that right? Yeah, well you know, ch like children have to uh, travel to get to us. Yeah. Now if you live in Dublin or if you live in Limerick, that's no problem, but if you're living way outside of that, there's a number of things that happen, right? You miss a day in school, um, your siblings probably have to get minded because your parents are also missing a day of work, yeah. and they have to travel up with you because it's a parallel experience. Yeah. There are obstacles yes. and there are stresses for families that don't need it. And we would have really loved in an ideal world for us to reach out and provide therapy in localised places where that kind of stress and barrier didn't present. It makes family. such sense. It is all down to money because we feel that this is not something that families should be charged for. We're a charity. We provide this service because it um, betters the community. But the service costs money and that's it's just, just so, it's so important and 
Yeah, it does feel like it has a lower profile mm-hmm. than the adult therapy services. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it probably should have higher ones. It yeah. absolutely should. But we're definitely working on that. And yeah. all we want to do is educate everybody yeah. about the services that are there. Yeah. What you can turn to them for. Yeah, because like that, you don't know. No, that's right. You don't. Until you're in it. And, and also take the mystery out of it and the yeah. fear out of it. And you see, one of the things, one of the essential ingredients for sexual abuse, right, is silence is yeah. one, and isolation is another. Without those two, you don't really get very far. But what happens is, is that people fear it so much that they apply the same things to it. So they don't talk about it and they push it away. And that way I'm protected from it. But actually with sex abuse, you can't do that. No. You've got to bring it in and talk about it. And yeah. you need, like children work really well with action plans. They work really well when yeah. they know what's happening next. But they don't know what to do next if something happens, if we aren't already talking about it in a space when it's not happening. If we want to truly protect ourselves, we have to stop being silent and we have to stop isolating it from us. Absolutely. We have to be able to talk about it in a way that's safe and empowering. So if something happens, here's our action plan, this is what we do. And when we talk about secrets, we need to talk about the fact that there's two types of secrets. You know, there's the secrets that, oh, I ate the chocolate in the fridge, don't tell mom. And then there's the secrets that make us feel upset inside. And what do we do with secrets that make us feel upset inside? Like children need an action plan, they don't know. It's not instinctive to know. Yeah. That's it. I'd love to know, is there some kind of talks you could give in schools? It would be really beneficial to hear it, the likes of that. I also think it's important that families and parents in particular can see that there is life after abuse if you're supported. Yeah. If you get the right interventions, there is actually, you can yeah. have a life. You can have, absolutely, and the life that you want. Open up the whole topic, make it so as it's okay to talk about. It's not dirty, it's not shameful. No. It's happened, we have to deal with it. Yeah. And let's talk about it. And the ability, I think, for children to have experienced that is a very different experience to the parent who yeah. hears it. We had this young woman a couple of years ago. She was engaged in one of her service, And she had told her parent about it. And the parent was engaged with us. Her mom was engaged with us about how she was feeling. And the parent, like the mom was just completely devastated by this. I mean, completely devastated. This has happened to her child. She didn't know what to do. The anxiety of it, the anger of it, it was just so overwhelming. And when we asked her how the little one was doing, they were calling Matilda, she said that Matilda was actually feeling quite good. She looked quite light and all that kind of stuff. And so when mom sat down and asked Matilda, um, what was going on? She said the most amazing thing, girls. She said, she said, Mom, it's like I've been walking around with a really heavy school bag on my back all the time, and now it's gone because now you know, I know that's never going to happen again. And there was that wonderful shift of anxiety move from the shoulders of this little one onto her safe adult, which was her mother, and her mother could feel the weight of it. But it was the appropriate shoulders for that weight to be on. Absolutely. We know there are mothers out there who collude and who abuse. We totally yeah. get that. But I believe the majority of women are like my mother, who were as much a victim as we were. Yeah. But we didn't understand that. So how could anybody outside understand yeah. that? And it was yeah. only through our journey that we were able to get to understanding how she knew the way we knew, but she didn't know consciously. How yeah. she was chosen yeah. specifically for his ability to control her. So yeah. she was as much a victim as we yeah. were. And you know, most of the callers to our helpline are mothers. So mothers are the ones that reach out and seek out information to try and implement safety. Measures They're the mothers the well enough to do that. Yeah. How many yeah. out there are lost? You mm-hmm. know, it's unbelievable. And, and if they're a mother of a perpetrator, mm-hmm. God help them. I mean, where can they turn? And they may as well have done it themselves because the whole family carries the shame yeah. and the burden of that crime. Yeah, because it's a shame again. Shame is something you hide. We were talking about this before. There was a 12-year-old child that felt attracted to young girls or boys. Who could they talk to? Mm-hmm. Now, they haven't acted on it, but they're aware of it and they know it's wrong. But what would they do? Where would they go? You see, there's a there's an organisation over in the UK called Stop It Now. They oh, work with that kind of st- stuff. People who have offended, but also people who are fearful that they might right. offend. They also do a lot of work with, there's a quite high level of suicide for of- offenders online who have just uh, been arrested. 
or had their home searched so there's really high levels of suicide there so they work with men who are in that cohort and they also work with families your partner has just been arrested this is what's going to happen or your child has just offended this is what's going to happen and they do really amazing work with that and we don't have the equivalent over here that I know of. We really do need to stop it now. We are all very reactive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's happened and then we react. Yeah, yeah. But to be able to act in a place before yeah, it happens. Yeah. It's like pulling teeth, trying to get them to fund the research but necessary to put the supports in place. They recognise this is a place that needs to be here. Why are you struggling for funding and resource issue? Which 85 is children on a waiting list. My yeah. God. Like... And we really feel the weight of that on our shoulders very yeah, deeply. I'd you know? say. Yeah, yeah, we do. And I'd say, like, this is a tough job. Yeah. You know, you absolutely must go to the depths. Like, it is a tough work. And I think, think everybody who works in this will agree with me. You become the biggest mood killer at a party. The Zoom and somebody <laughs> asks you what you do, you're like, oh. It is difficult. But it's so rewarding, girls. Like, it's so That's rewarding. It. Like they talk about vicarious trauma a lot, but there's vicarious impairment, yeah. for sure. When you watch a child maybe walk into court and they're hunched over and they're terrified and they won't make any eye contact in case of the yeah. offender that's in the foyer, to walk out five days later with their chest up and out and their head held high, like that goes with them home and touches everything that they do. So how many staff do you have? Well, in the two centres... Um, I think our staff cohort makes up about 50, I think, between the two. And then we have about 40 volunteers because we have volunteers that provide um, forensic accompaniment in the Satu for 14 and 15 year olds in Dublin, in Rotunda, and also in the Barn House oh, right. in Galway. Have you a view on Tussler's new guidelines that they're introducing? Okay, so my view on the guidelines would be I understand that those guidelines are in response to judicial reviews that took place um, where of alleged offenders felt due process was not um, cared for in there. And this stems from um, maybe weak legislation, and I don't think you can fix legislation with a policy. So that's the first issue I think that they have. I think maybe they need to go back to the legislator and fix their legislation. Yeah. The policy that they've tried to put on to fix that legislation originated in, uh, as my understanding, originated to deal with retrospective cases, but actually it applies to children as well. Yeah. And whilst um, the reporting of it mentioned the ways in which offenders could stress test the allegation, um, what they didn't report was that um, a child has the right to refuse. Now my view is that's not strong enough. Exactly. And in my view is you're dealing with a type of pathology where manipulation is extremely sophisticated and that is a loophole that I think they will jump down and could cause lots of delays and lots of intimidation and I can just see that going down a rabbit hole that is not going to be productive for the process and for the child. So, Very diplomatic, are you? Thank you. Yeah. So... Um, <laughs> I feel that really when it comes to children, and we, we are including children in retrospective cases as well. It could be a retrospective case in the child 17. So when it comes to children, we have to be really, really clear about the imbalance of power and the levels of manipulation. And we have to be ironclad in making sure that we're balancing the process with due process and due care. My fear would be that this could be a child would have to engage with this who is maybe a bit vulnerable and um, not being advocated for correctly not being safeguarded correctly maybe they're in care or something like that i can just see a huge vulnerability yeah. and um, it's wide open to abuse going. isn't it yeah yeah and because they're saying it's a guideline the word itself yeah. implies yeah. lots of problems yeah absolutely it's just not um, watertight enough for me just that they can refuse is not watertight enough for me. I think that society dictates the law that society lives by. Really, we are the ones who choose. And so it's a matter of getting together and choosing, maybe a little bit like the way we chose about the water bill yeah. and how we came together so solidly around that. Right. It might be an idea to do that in regards to safeguarding our children. Other oh, than financial, what is the biggest challenge when you're dealing with? your clients here 
Well, I suppose the financial to get access to them, that's a big challenge. For Another challenge for us is people still don't like to stand beside it. I don't understand that. Because we don't sexually abuse children. And I understand why they don't want to stand beside that. But we give children back their lives. And I think that's something that really should be stood aside. And I still think there's that huge stigma around standing beside it publicly. And you're only serving to maintain the shame. I want people to come together as a community with this. And if we do it in a way that is preventative, we're, um, we're saving children in a very powerful way so that we don't have 85 children on a waiting list. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, it's twofold for me. Yeah. It's about getting the children access to the supports they need when it happens. But it's also about living in a way where it can be avoided, it can be safeguarded against, where everybody gets the support they need that we don't go down that road. They're, that's equally as important for me. Um, and we need to come together. I'm not going to get that over the line. No one person is going to get that over the line. No one organisation is going to get that over the line. But together. We have to make a decision as a community, as a society. That's what we're going to do. And it means being uncomfortable for five minutes. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. We can do it. Well, Eve, it's been an absolute pleasure oh, talking to you. Ladies, it really is heartwarming to know you're at the head of an organisation. Oh, thank you very much. Looking after our children. Thank you. Thank you so very much. <laughs>